Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is my interview with Soundgarden producer Michael Beinhorn, where he talks about making Black Hole Sun, Spoon Man, how Chris Cornell records vocals, and more. So Michael, what did you think of Chris Cornell's demo for Black Hole Sun when you first heard it? I'll, I'll never forget when I first heard that song. I called him up and I was like, I was like, I remember the first thing out of my mouth was, you're a fucking genius. And he's like, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> I'm like, seriously, That's what awesome. you did? And he's like, what did I do? <laughs> it's one of those things where you know exactly where you are you or you remember exactly where you are when you hear it. You know, um, I remember it is as clear as day. I mean, I was... I remember the room in, in this old house I was living in that I was listening to it, where, where I was listening to it. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like from the from the very first notes, it was at the end of this tape. I don't even know if Chris realized how he'd sequenced the songs on this tape, mm -hmm. but he did it, in, whatever it was, it was in such a way where he saved, literally saved the best for last. And it was a whole experience getting to it. Like it started with Bell on Black Days. And then there was another song that he did with Jerry Cantrell, which was great, but was more of a blues rock song. And then he did a song called Tighter and Tighter, which I loved. And I wish that we'd cut for Super Unknown, but the band beat uh, voted it off the record. And then finally, there's this song at the end. And I'm waiting for it. I was like, okay, you know, this is good. This is really good. And then the first notes come on, I was like, what is this? Yeah. It just instantaneously, like, what am I listening to? Because, I mean, the chord structures were so bizarre to me. Like, I hadn't heard anyone do anything like this before. I mean, it was beautiful, but at the same time, it was definitely very abstract, you know. And, I mean, I wouldn't say dissonant. It was, you know, I, I don't even know what kind of what kind of music you could, you could really compare it to. Yeah. Uh, and then the song kicks in and I'm like, this is incredible. So at that point, I'm kind of like on the edge of my seat yeah. because I've seen this, I've seen similar movies like this before. And the movie goes like song starts out amazing. Then the chorus hits and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> it's the whole thing sags. And then you go, all right, well, we got some work to do. Obviously, I don't want to do that work or tell go back to the songwriter. You've got work to do. So I'm sitting there going like, I, I'm just not, <laughs> I'm not ready for what's going to, because I've already made a tremendous emotional investment in the song from listening to it. So I get closer and closer to the chorus and everything's perfect. Like literally, like nothing is out of place about it at all. And then the chorus hits and I'm like, oh, <gasps> that's awesome. <laughs> you know, because it's, because it's absolutely perfect. Like there's yeah. nothing about it that's off. I'm like, this is a fully formed piece of pure genius that just got rained on this guy. Like, I mean, I get choked up just thinking about it. It, it was incredible. It was so gorgeous, that one moment. And it had a really powerful, like, emotional effect on me, too. And I couldn't stop listening to it. It was really extraordinary. So, yeah, it hit me with both barrels. And I told him, he was like, oh, you like it? <laughs> and I was like, like it? You know, I told him, and he was actually kind of surprised hmm. it surprised me but then what i found even more surprising was when i went around to other people and was like you know people in the band you know even people i play it for i was like this is i mean it's it's incredible and they're gonna be like yeah it's okay and people like what yeah i mean it's okay are we listening to the same song here yeah. like it's not okay and they're like yeah i mean at one point i spoke to one of the guys in the band and they were kind of like yeah we'll you know I, I was talking about when we record it and they're like, yeah, we'll see, you know, we'll see if we record it. I was like, if, yeah. oh, <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you know, that, that's the story about that one. I actually played it for my manager too. And he had a similar response. And at that point I didn't, I didn't feel like I'd taken crazy pills or anything like yeah. that, but I, I was just like, okay, well, everyone's wrong and I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> because this song is incredible and I know it's incredible. Oh, for sure. And that's interesting that you mentioned that because I was going to ask you, you know, Chris has gone on record saying that he was surprised that that song did as well as it did. And it actually, to a degree, kind of bummed him out that that was the biggest song on the record because he felt that there were other songs that were of a higher caliber, so to speak. 
It's funny to hear you say that now, actually, because I think that he re he recognized the kind of power that that song had. That I think Chris was a lot more aware, at least my experience of him, he was a lot more aware of the the, the effect of the music that he wrote. Hmm. And I think he looked at it as kind of like, um, you know, he had a good he, he had a good stockpile of songs and he he knew he knew that that song was really was, I mean, for lack of a better word, powerful currency, hmm. you know, so I never had that experience with him. I mean, I think that he it, in fact, it was the one song on the record where the he did he did two passes on that um, two separate days and he did his first vocal for it. I comped it and he came back and listened to it and he just looked at me. He's like, sucks. We got to do it over. You know, that's I've never seen a vocalist do that before where they actually listen back to their own work and they're like, it's not good enough. You know, and I, I was pretty impressed by that, you know, so but he he knew that he had to do it again. You know, he he felt very strongly that it wasn't good enough. So he put 110 percent into that one. And he was well aware that that was at least in my experience, that that was the, that was actually the showpiece of the record. I mean, the record was great. And it would have been great without it, but mm -hmm. the fact that that was there, that really, that, that kind of sealed the deal on it. No, for sure. So, I mean, for someone, you know, you were probably the person that was most excited about that song going into recording it. So the time comes around to record now in studio. How are you feeling? Are you still excited to get this down? Yeah, I mean, I was excited. I was a little nervous because I was like, because I had a, I had a very high expectation of what we were going to live up to. I mean, it was, it was an excited kind of nervous. Like I just wanted to dive into it and make it as great as it could possibly be. And from every step of the way, I, it was, it was never a letdown. Like when Matt started playing the song, I was like, Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he did three passes of the song and I think the second or third take he did, he played this extraordinary drum fill, which of course is on it's it it comes in right before the the, the final chorus of the that boom 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 like that. And you know, I was like, oh, that's that's it. That's incredible. You know, we put the bass on, it sounds great. You know, and then um we started, we we did the guitar, it sounded great. Like every step of the way, it was just magical. Yeah, you know, it just kept getting better and better and better and better. And obviously my intent was to make sure that whatever we had was out, far outstripped the demo. Um, I mean, the demo is actually really good. You can find it on YouTube, mm -hmm. in fact. But we we definitely wound up smoking the demo pretty well, so I was happy about that. That's awesome. And so in terms of Kim's guitar work, uh, that solo near the end of the song, it's not only is the solo good, but the way it's recorded, it just it sounds very different than a lot of the other solos that were coming out at that point in time. How did you approach recording his guitars for that record? Well, Kim had a particular setup that he liked, and uh, we didn't really deviate too far away from it because he was adamant about it. It was actually one of the worst sounding rigs I've ever heard in my entire life. Um, Interesting. It, yeah, and it really couldn't, it really wasn't very useful for rhythm guitar stuff at all. So, but, you know, for whatever reason, when it came time to do solos, it, you know, what, what he was playing through suited it pretty well. On Black Hole Sun, we recorded a bunch of, we recorded a bunch of leads. And I think we had at least two tracks of like backward guitar. Hmm. So when Brendan, when it came time for Brendan to mix, he had one track of like forward guitar and one track of backward guitar and he just kind of like faded them in and out. Kim just, you know, he laid them down and then he couldn't really make up his mind about what he liked. So he would, he pulled everyone in the room, you know, and we were all like, you've got enough stuff there. It really sounds good. I'm sure between all the passes that you've done, we've got enough to work with, but he wasn't satisfied. So he just called his friends up and had them come to the studio and listen. And I think for like about the next three hours, it was all about people just kind of reassuring him <laughs> <laughs> and telling him that he'd actually, that he played it really well and that there probably wasn't anything that he could have done better. Um, so finally, after a while, we were able to move away from it.
That's so cool. <laughs> and so how is Kim in general as a guitarist to work with? What's he like in the studio? Um, he was pretty distracted, you know, really? for the most part. I mean, honestly, like Chris played most of the rhythm guitar in the record. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim was kind of, he was funny in the studio because he, he would, he would show up late most days and he would, he wouldn't get started until much later in the evening. And, uh, you know, most of the time you couldn't get a whole lot of work out of him. Really? But he was a really, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, is that he's, he's one of the most gifted conversationalists I've ever met and, you know, just really fun to hang out with. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's, I mean, he's a terrific guitarist as well. You know, he, I, I don't think that he was really into playing a lot of the rhythm guitar parts. So it, it was, it was easier. I mean, for the songs that Chris wrote, Chris played his rhythm parts and, you know, he did all the arpeggios. He, he did everything on Black Hole Sun except for the leads. Black Hole Sun didn't exist as far as I knew before I started working with them. When I began the project, they sent me a demo tape, which had about 10 or 11 ideas on it. And uh, of those 10 ideas, I think five of them were actually workable. And the rest of it was kind of, it was all just like experiments and jams and things like that. And I was like, this is, we can't make a record off this. You know, so I had to tell them like, we can't rush into the studio yet because you guys don't have enough material to make a record. I don't think they were very happy about that, but it was, it was the truth. And in, it was about a two month period uh, between the time I got that tape and the time that we started working. And in that time, that to my knowledge is when Black Hole Sun was created. It was, I, I, to the best, of, the best of my knowledge, it was after a particular conversation that I had with Chris about songwriting. I wasn't, I wasn't specifically directing him to write more melodic songs. I was really just directing him to go toward the things that he felt he liked as a songwriter. It, you know, it wasn't about, Hey, you need to write, write more melodic songs. It was like, no, just write things that vibe with you, that you feel comfortable with, that you like, or I should say that you love. Um, and, 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 because he he pretty much he'd been sending me so much stuff at that point. I know that if Black Hole Sun existed in any form, I would have gotten it long before that. Because he was actually sending me songs at that point. He sent me one song, which is a country song that he'd written for Johnny Cash, because hmm. Rick Rubin had been pumping him for for material for the, the one of those Cash records that he did. That is so cool. And so, do you remember the recording process, particularly for Black Hole Sun? Yeah, it was it was like all the other songs, pretty much, you know, drums first, bass guitar. Then we did all his Leslie guitars, which is that uh, rotating speaker sound that you hear at the beginning of the song. And OK, that's yeah, that's pretty much. And it did, I, we, we changed speeds for, for a couple of the tracks. Yeah, he did those and then some other guitar parts. And then he did all his vocals. One of the things that I read about your work with Chris Cornell that I thought was really interesting, and I wanted to understand why, apparently you made him listen to Frank Sinatra before he recorded vocals. Is this correct? He'd, we, did the batch, we did the songs in batches of four. And after the first four songs, I, I mean, I, I was liking what I was getting, but I still felt there was always a certain amount of restraint that I felt from Chris. Like he wasn't always just kind of like giving, excuse me, everything – that he had emotionally. That was my, that was my sense of it, and I just wanted to get that, you know, a little bit more out of him. And I just started thinking of all the different ways I could do that. And I I would always go back to Sinatra, because he I always felt as one of the consummate pop vocalists of the 20th century, really in, in history. His use of dynamics, like the way he would go from powerful to very soft like he really used his voice as this instrument with such immense range it was phenomenal and i played two songs for chris you know just to kind of give him an idea of what i was talking about uh and when i got done he 
he kind of looked at me and started laughing. And he's like, all right, thanks very much. I appreciate it. And he just walked out of the room. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. But then it was really funny because, I mean, he completely, you know, just shut me down on the whole thing. And I was like, oh, all right, I I tried at least. (laughs) But then I started listening back to some of his vocal performances later on. And I realized that he'd begun to incorporate some of what he'd heard. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, the thing was, is that I found that pop vocalists, especially in rock, that they would do their vocal performances kind of like in blocks, like Mm -hmm. the vocal sits here, dum, da, dum, da, dum, stop, dum, da, dum, da, dum, stop, dum, da, dum, da, dum, stop. There was no ad lib. There was no kind of going over the bar line. There was no drawing out of a particular lyric to kind of, you know, in in a way that a vocalist like Sinatra or, you know, even people in, in rock bands like, you know, in the Beatles, or Zeppelin, people would play with lyrics more. And by the 90s, they pretty much stopped doing that completely. There wasn't any any experimenting with dynamics or ways to kind of make the song take root more emotionally. And I noticed when I listened to the vocal on Black Hole Sun, for example, I was like, you fuck, you, you, you're actually doing it. I was like, you listen, good. That's awesome. <laughs> So in general, how is Chris to work with as a vocalist? Like, what did you think of his approach in the studio, his abilities? What are your thoughts on all that whole thing? Um, you know, what can you say? I mean, Chris was one of the greatest rock vocalists ever, in my opinion. Um, you know, he, I also found that he was incredibly uncomfortable singing in the studio. Like, I don't, I just got the sense that he didn't like to have people around him very much when he did what he did. Hmm. So the first batch of four songs that on that record, which were, I think, um, Kickstand, um, My Wave, um, Spoon Man, and I can't remember the last one. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd, he'd done it, he'd cut everything in the recording studio with myself and the engineer there. And we did it the way we would normally record a vocalist, do a bunch of passes and, you know, and I, again, I, I just felt like there was something missing. And it just occurred to me suddenly that he, like I said, he just wasn't comfortable singing around people. And I kind of flashed back to an experience I had where I saw him perform on stage at Roseland hmm. in New York. And he was like, you know, this the entire time hunched over, but I could, you just got this vibe that he was very, he wasn't connecting with the audience and he didn't like it. And I was like, all right, we're going to try something different. So I set him up in the studio because I knew that he was a home recordist, like he did all his own demos. Mm -hmm. So I set him up in the studio with his vocal mic in, in the room and we tried headphones and then we tried doing this thing where you can put speakers out of phase with one another. So one side is in, one side is out of the, the near field monitors. In this case, we're using Yamaha and S10s. Hmm. And you aim those, you aim those to the back of the microphone, which is in a cardioid um, pattern. And that means that only the front of the mic is picking up. The rear of the mic is completely rejecting anything that comes out of it. So you've got an out of phase signal. So there's, so that all the bass is being cut out and it's all being aimed at the back of the microphone. So you can hear it in the room, but everything that could be detrimental in terms of pick up into the microphone is mainly traveling into the back of the mic. And we actually compared it and it turned out that the speakers had less, had the speakers had less feed into the, into the microphone than the headphones. So we were completely sold on this. So he, did all his vocals like that. He knew how to, we t- showed him how to arm and the uh, tape machine and change tracks at the patch bay. And we pretty much left him alone. I was like, you cut as many, do as many tracks of the, you know, vocal passes of this song as you want. When you're done, just come down to the lounge where we'll be raiding, get us. I'll come up, listen. And, you know, if, if we're all happy, we'll make a comp and that'll be the song. And he started working that way and he came down to the lounge about a half hour later and he was completely like flushed. And he was like, I'm never working any other way again. This is amazing. Like he was so happy. (laughs) That's so cool. 
So, you know, I heard that yeah. he, that during your sessions with him, his voice apparently broke two compressor mics. Like it was something along those lines. Is that accurate? Not a compressor mic. Um, it's the microphone itself. And it wasn't two. We were using these Neumann U87 mic microphones, which are um, the, the capsules, they're, 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 they're condenser mics. So they're not really designed for like massive amounts of SPL sound pressure level. Mm -hmm. This guy, obviously, he could yell. Yeah. He had a lot of SPL. So gradually what he was doing was he was destroying, you know, and I, I had him singing right up on the mic because mm -hmm. I wanted a lot of proximity from him. I didn't want. I, w I didn't care about what happened to the, the diaphragm <laughs> at that point, you know, so I had him up close on the mic. So he was slowly destroying the mics, Jeez. essentially. And I think the studio had five and I believe that we went through all five of them. Really? I'm pretty sure that we destroyed, that he destroyed the capsules on all five of the microphones. Cause I remember Reed Ruddy, who is the studio manager coming to me with bills and he was like, you know, and I was like, <laughs> I'm Man. sorry. You know, I mean, at least they're not, they're not rear vintage microphones. So yeah. it wasn't impossible to get him, you know, to, to get him recapsuled. Uh, but, oh, well, art calls. That is, that is really <laughs> cool. You know, I heard that, um, I think you may have said it, that Chris has two different vocal ranges. Was that, was that you who said that? Someone in the camp said that about him. And would would that be fair to say? Well, I mean, he had a bunch of, he had a lot of different ones, but I found that um, my issue was that I had a hard time finding a microphone that would really capture everything. So when we first started recording him, I could only find two mics that work with him and both of them were in different ranges. So initially what I did for the first four songs was record his voice in one range where he was singing. And then I went back with the other mic and recorded the other range, which is pretty ass backwards actually. But like, I, there were too many um, ingredients in the equation. Like I just wanted him up on the mic so much and I just couldn't get what I wanted out of any one microphone. And we went through about like 30, I think. Wow. So I read a quote from Adam Casper where he said that essentially you had an a quote, electronic music agenda when you were making this record. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> An agenda. Um, <laughs> I was, it was interesting because I had, ele the, ele the electronics, as I think I explained it to, to Adam, was kind of like something that sort of drove me a little bit. Um, I kind of conceived of this whole thing as being sort of larger than life. Like I had this concept of like hyper reality in a way. Hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of, of photorealist painters like Chuck Close. Hmm. And I wanted to create this record where you could kind of like feel everything where there was sort of like a tangible sort of like sense around um, the vibe to the music that, you know, when Matt hit the snare that you felt like you were almost inside the snare, like you could see the snares rattling and feel the impact of it. And I didn't feel that people were making rock records that really had this kind of excitement to them anymore. You know, I mean, certainly people were making great records at that point, but I felt like there was a kind of they, they were sort of they're sort of catering more to like the genre like there were specific genres that were being that were being etched out in in various types of rock and people were sort of gradually setting into whatever their genre was and obviously soundgarden were considered to be a grunge rock band they've kind of been pegged pegged into this sort of into that subgenre and I had a tremendous issue with that because I didn't see them that way. And I didn't think that it was right to kind of, to, 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 to create that kind of perception for them, to reinforce that perception. To me, it was kind of, it was, it was selling them short. And it, I think it, it, you know, it was kind of like cutting them off at the leg, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, so they wouldn't be able to grow. It's like, this is a rock band. They're not a grunge rock band. They're just a rock band. You know, let's give them as much space as they can, you know, or you could say that they're a bunch of popular musicians who use guitars and drums, you know, mm -hmm. 
Why can't it be as loose as that? So to me, there, you know, I wanted to create a record that had this immediacy to it. And the only place I could find that immediacy was in electronic music, was in like, you know, um, you know, stuff like techno and Aphex Twin and things like that, you know, um, because there was so much, there was so much aggression and, you know, there's samples, there are a lot of sampled sounds in the music, which of course is, you know, digit, digitized sound. It's the transients are very quick and synthesizers that are distorted. And it was, it was very exciting and it was missing to me all the aggression that rock music just didn't seem to have as much of anymore. That's interesting. So I want to ask you about Spoon Man. Do you remember working on that song and in particular when artist, the real life Spoon Man, came into the studio to record with Soundgarden? I'll never forget it as long as I live. Really? What sticks out to you about that one? Well, I mean, his his um, his uh, recording, artist's recording. That day in particular, where artist came in was was pretty amazing. I mean, by the end, of, like he had he had this bedroll that was full of like spoons and metal implements and things like that. And it was just this sort of like rolling nonstop kind of like thing where the guy is hitting himself with spoons. Like his fingers are going like this constantly. He's yeah. just in constant movement. He's whacking his body, his head, his arms, his legs, you know, his, his chest, everything, and reaching down and grabbing some new implement and putting down what he'd used before. It's, it's basically like performance art. It was extraordinary. He did that four times. By the end, he's completely covered with blood, you know, because he was hitting himself so hard. Yeah, I mean, everyone in the studio was kind of. <laughs> <laughs> That's what... so how do you record spoons in the studio? Uh, we put up a pair of ambient. The engineer, Jason Corsaro, put up a pair of ambient mics um, in his immediate proximity to get like a little the teensy teensy bit of the room obviously that gets lost pretty fast in the in all the guitars um but to to get as much as um uh, of the spoons as possible i mean obviously there's no way to close mic someone who's who's moving around yeah. that quickly you know so it had to be a proximity thing yeah so just your personal reaction when when you first saw him doing his thing were you like stunned like what was your reaction to that yeah, I was pretty stunned. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd seen street musicians, but this is a whole different level. Yeah, for sure. And was there any concern he might break something just because he's like kind of going nuts in the studio? He'd done, he'd clearly been doing this for many years. So I think he kind of understood what his own physical range was. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any chance that that was going to happen. I mean, he was going nuts, but it wasn't as, he stayed within a pretty tight zone. The song is about him. Actually, his I think his, there's still a video of him up on YouTube. He has a video of uh, him performing one of the takes that we did for the record in in Bad Animals. And just by watching that video, I think you can get an idea of why it was so essential to have him on the record because. You know, he was a street musician. A lot of people came to see him perform. And there was just, th there's nothing quite like it. Mm -hmm. You know, his performance was very theatrical. And he's just, re he's just remarkably talented. It was a, it was a, it was an incredible experience for us all to watch this. And, you know, so it, it made perfect sense to have him on the song. You know, I mean, the rest of it, it was pretty much, pretty much by the book you know we we cut the drums for it then we put the bass on mm -hmm. you know and then the guitars then um i think chris had recorded yeah chris had recorded his vocals by that time so we had artists come in while we were working on some other songs mm. and he did his parts earlier we spoke about your electronic music approach so to speak when it came to recording the record producing the record Kim has said that Super Unknown, in his opinion, is the perfect headphones record. Like, it's the great soundscape. What exactly did you do on a technical level to get the soundscape for that record? I wanted to make sure that instead of having these like dum 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 type bass sounds, yeah, or yeah. I should say more clang, 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 clang bass sounds, <laughs> that we had something that might have had a little top to it, but also had a lot, like a round like to it, like that, that was powerful and deep. 
you know, so I really, I, I wanted to get actually some dub in there yeah. <laughs> as well, you know, cause it's so unrewarding to hear a bassist hit a sustained note and have it go boom. You yeah, know, know where's saying. the boom, you know, mm -hmm. you want the note to hang. And if we hadn't taken the time with that sound, those long notes on Black Hole Sun, for example, it wouldn't have been there. You know, Brendan would have had to fiddle with a compressor when he mixed to try and get them to come up more if that was even something that was relevant. But, you know, man, those those notes really had to they had to linger for a long time. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, so basically I did we did a lot of stuff like that. You know, with the guitars, it was the same thing, like trying to find the right coloration to sit with the bass. So I didn't want to have a guitar sound that everyone else had. I wanted to get something else, something that was unique. Unfortunately, Chris was using very different guitars for rhythm, mm -hmm. so that helped. And we had a we had a great rig, and we wound up getting some really great guitar sounds. Did you do a you lot know? of layering so, afterwards? Uh, a lot of layering on that one. On like on guitars and vocals, like was there a lot of layering for that record, or how did you approach that part of it? Not much. I mean, for the guitars, for the for the for the main rhythm stuff, it was usually just a pair, mm -hmm. one pair. That was it. I, I felt that the rhythm section aspect of this record had to be very, very, had to stand away from the pack. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of that was because I, I felt that rock records had kind of deviated towards this, um, this really kind of thin sound where you got some attack out of the drums, but you didn't get a whole bunch of low end and depth and the same. And the bass was kind of thought of as a, kind of like an it was like an afterthought which yeah you know if you listen to records from like the 60s and 70s bass is out front because you know we're only a couple of years away from r&b records mm -hmm. you know which is where rock comes from and blues and things like that and bass is obviously a big deal you know you're driving the you're driving the rhythm section with the bass and the drums mm -hmm. and Especially like with bands like Metallica with their records, I mean, they just tried to bury bass guitar as much as possible. And I was like, what? why would you do that? Mm. You know, so my feel is like I I, I have to go the opposite direction. I, I, I came from more of an R&B background um, and I I love dub music very much and things like mm. that where, where bass is very prevalent. So when you look and when you listen to Led Zeppelin records, for example, yeah, you yeah. can hear every note the bass is playing. And that's re it's really important because there's a lot of counterpoint in bass, you know, so to kind of eliminate it or to kind of stick it way in the background is to me, it's kind of silly. I mean, you're missing all this beautiful like movement and, you know, and again, like counterpoint against vocal melody, because if you're in a rock band, you can't really you, you don't have a lot of experience there aren't a lot of opportunities to experiment with counterpoint without interfering with the guitar with interfering with the vocal because the only instrument you have apart from bass to do counterpoint would be a guitar mm -hmm. you know and you could be playing in the vocalist range so to me the rhythm section sound was going to be important on this record um i found a rack of old Neve modules that no one had ever heard of before these 1057s, which were Germanian had Germanium transistors in them hmm. as opposed to 1073s, which had Silicon transistors. And they featured heavily in the drum sound on this record. Um, they just added this punch and this presence that I've never really heard before, you know, and I spent a lot of time getting a drum sound on that record. And the band were not happy about that either. Really? I mean, they, <laughs> if you look on their Wikipedia page, in the Wikipedia page for the record, and you see Chris complaining about how anally retentive I was about getting sounds <laughs> on the record. That's really where it started. And I don't think that they were prepared for that either. Hmm. Um, we, we hadn't really, of course, we hadn't gotten into, we never had a conversation about aesthetics or anything like that before the, the record began. So... You know, uh, they didn't know what they were in for. But, you know, all of a sudden here I am fiddling around with microphones and EQs and this thing and that thing. And, you know, this drum head, that drum head. And, you know, and and the engineer, Jason Corsaro, I think that he had hoped that we were going to do this record really fast. 
I think he wanted he his idea was to make like a three microphone setup and be done. And, I, and for me, it was just you know as many mics as we can get out there. I, you know, I wanted det- a lot of detail on everything, and he didn't like that very much either. <laughs> I mean, he went along with it grudgingly. He certainly contributed to it as well. Um, he had some added some very important contributions. I mean, we had a pair of overhead U sixty seven microphones that was that that really helped us sound a great deal but originally that was going to be part of his drum sound like two overheads one kick drum mic gotcha. and boom and i was like yeah i was like okay that's great we're going to add those to all the other mics and he was like oh no wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. so we got this we got this drum sound after about like five or six days and the band were kind of like we could have cut all the drum tracks in these past five or six days i mean they were really pissed off at that point but I was like, you know, I, I realized that I was not making myself very popular. But, you know, I looked at the record and I was like, look, this is you guys shot. You know, mm-hmm. you've hired me to do a job, right? And if you, you know, if you, you're hiring me to do this job, I'm going to do it the best way I see fit. I'd like you to have something that you're going to not only be able to live with, but it's going to actually be relevant to you in like 20 years or something like that. Mm-hmm you know, that's going to be meaningful and that, that will be long lasting, maybe outlast all of us if we're really lucky, you know, so I just kind of stuck to my guns on it. So, you know, you said now that you kind of stuck to your guns, you wanted to get this record done right, so it would last as long as it can. And certainly you succeeded in that, you know, Super Unknown is one of, is is their biggest record, one of the biggest records from the 90s period. When that record really took off, what was your reaction to it? Did you expect that success or like, how did you, what was your reaction? I didn't really know what to expect. Hmm. Uh, I knew that at least one of the songs on the record was going to be very, very well received. I felt that there were a bunch of other songs on the record that could do, that, that could be received well also. But I knew that Black Hole Sun was, that was going to, you know, really turn people's heads. Uh, I had no idea how well it was going to do. I, it just wasn't really in my, um, it wasn't in my purview. Like I, I didn't, I, I didn't think like that so much. I just wanted to make the best record that I could with these guys because I wanted to make sure that they had something that would sustain their careers and would also have some, some duration to it, some longevity. Mm-hmm. And so you mentioned now that, uh, at a certain point, things started to get, you know, a little bit tense with the guys because you kept pressing to get certain things on a certain way. Uh, from what I understand, you recorded the record from July to September of 93. At what point did that start to happen, that kind of tension? Was it later on? Like, how early did that start? The tension? Not necessarily tension. might be the um, wrong word. The, uh, like, the, the conflict of let's just move on, no, let's stay. Oh, no, it was, no, it was tense. I, no, I mean, tension is... is is the right is definitely the right word i mean it kind of happened before we went into the studio um i think matt started to get kind of disenchanted with working with me early on um it might have had something to do with the fact that i i told the guys that i felt that they needed to have more material for the record um i I was never really sure and you know then i come in and instead of having a drum sound in 20 minutes it takes five days you know, and I'm trying everything in in the studio. Like I even brought in a digital tape machine to see if that sounded better for the drums than the analog tape mm-hmm. machines. And, you know, they, they just weren't having it. So already things were getting kind of, were, were getting kind of rough. And, you know, we had an additional, we had an initial break in period where they were uncomfortable with how I was working. And I don't think that they ever completely got used to it. Um, but I didn't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get fired at any point. So I guess that they tolerated it enough. Uh, I think that even though they didn't like that, they, 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 they accepted the bet. They, they made the bed that they had to, that they had to lie in um, or you know, they, they accepted the bed that they had to lie in. They didn't, they just didn't like the way the bed had been made. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but they kind of they just they accepted it after a while but it was never it was never an easy process making that record i hear you but sometimes you need that that tension actually contributes to the creative energy i find when it comes to a lot of the really great records out there just my observation it can mm -hmm. it, it definitely can i mean i'm there isn't one aspect of this record that i'm going to look back on and go it should have been done differently because i think the ends more than justify the means you know and i i'm i i've never been anything less than incredibly proud of that record and there isn't one part of it that i think should or could have been done differently you know again i'm proud of that record i'm, I'm happy to have worked with those guys um uh, i'm I'm thrilled beyond belief that it worked well, that it worked out well for them, which is all I really wanted to do. And they deserved it, you know, because they're they were they're a fantastic band. And uh, you know, and they wrote amazing songs. I mean, I can talk for days about the work that I did on it, but you know, the record wouldn't have existed without their music and their performances. So they they more than rose to the occasion on it. Mm -hmm. You know, they did a fantastic job. I really had to take an unpopular position on that record quite frequently. I mean, a lot, most of the, a good portion of the record was me taking an unpopular position, mm. usually with the band or a band member or something like that. And I never liked being in that position, but at the same time, it's, I, I just feel if you're, if you're doing something that's got any kind of artistic um, resonance to it, something that's going to resonate with people emotionally, it's really important to kind of, I felt that it was important for me to stand my ground and to, and to really, and, and to, to hold that principle really true. And it worked on super unknown and, you know, it, it created something that I, I certainly feel is timeless. Uh, so that, that record it's, I mean, it, it's like a person to me. It's like, it's one of the, it's like one of my children. I mean, I obviously didn't create the music, but I felt that I was kind of like the midwife, you know, I mean, I, I, I feel affection for it at like, like a child, you know? So when I think about it, I have a very, it's got a very special place in my heart. And I, I, I do, I love it the way in a, a way similar to how I would love a person. You know, you're the producer on the record, but Soundgarden is also credited as producer on the record. Why is that? Well, when I took the project, one of the uh, prerequisites was that the band wanted to take a, a co-production credit. Hmm. Um, so I, that was just something that I agreed to. I mean, they were certainly, they were certainly involved in decision-making, but, you know, as far as like the, the album conceptually, it's interesting, actually, conceptually, I don't feel that they participated in that way. Um, they certainly weren't involved in any way and how the how how it eventually how it wound up sounding um which you know i it is what it is i'm 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 okay with that you know they didn't they didn't get into like mic placements or anything like that or you know arguing about why using that eq as opposed to this one or you know hey it needs to be a little brighter mm -hmm. you know there was there was none of that so it wasn't it it, it wasn't as if there was it, it, i would say it was a real co-production per se so what did they do more or less that was actually would qualify as producing? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, I think that perhaps the approach that we took in doing like four songs at a time would, could qualify as that. Um, I mean, I'm trying to, yeah, no give worries. them as wide a berth as possible. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of the decision making as far as um, all the decision making as far as Sonic stuff was really down to me. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, if they if they didn't like something, they were certainly they were in a position to be able to say that sounds like crap. But I didn't get a whole lot of that. I mean, I got a lot of complaining. That you're t this is taking so long or, you know, like we could have had this record done like weeks ago, but no one was complaining about how it sounded. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, aside from the negativity, was there any kind of lighter, funny moments you remember from working with them? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, they were, they could, if they were in a good mood, they could be hysterical. Chris in particular, actually, I've worked on a song with Herbie Hancock that was called Rocket. Mm -hmm. And it was an instrumental track. 
and Chris would pretend to be a chicken singing the song and he'd go to he'd walk up to me and go, <laughs> <laughs> <That's like funny. laughs> any reason why you know because he, he was in a goofy mood on a couple of songs like i think he was playing rhythm guitar with with um matt mm-hmm. in the room uh and i just remember him like making up songs on the spot hmm. um one of them was called bing bing goes to temple <laughs> <laughs> which he dedicated to me i actually have a recording of this um, really i had a dat running the entire time yeah it's it's really funny um uh, you gotta upload that do, man. do stuff like that what's that you gotta upload that man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was he, he he could he he was pretty funny at times it was good it was it was nice to see him like that he was you know when he was in a light in a lighter frame of mind he was really it was a lot of fun to be around. Yeah, for sure. Toward the end of the record, we had to deal with the fact that we had probably about 80 minutes of music, 80 plus, actually more than 80, and we couldn't make a record like that. So we had to knock a song off. And everyone had their lists. And um, I can't remember what mine was to take off the record, but we wound up taking that song tighter and tighter off. That was one of Chris's, one of the um, songs on that demo that Chris had sent me that had fell on Black Days and Black Hole Sun. I was really sad about that because I liked the song, but Ben was like, he was really dead set against that. Like he couldn't stand it. Hmm. And the irony of that is that it wound up on their next record. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting. You know, I think it's a great song. I really liked it. And I like the version that we had of it was really good. I mean, it would have sounded really nice. You know, I certainly now that the record's out, I don't miss it being on there at all. Mm -hmm. Do you know where your version of it is, so to speak? Um, At this point, I don't think we ever did a vocal on it. And at this point in time, I think it was burnt um, up in that UMG fire. Oh, really? It was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think apart from some dats that I have, it doesn't exist anywhere. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I mean, it sounds like you have a lot of, uh, uh, what's the word, rare recordings that no one else has of Soundgarden. You got you to gotta post those eventually. I don't think I want to get in trouble with anybody. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about Ben Shepard. He's a great bassist, and his work is an important part of Soundgarden's sound. Why do you think it happens so often in rock bands that the importance of bass is overlooked? I have absolutely no fucking idea if the bassist is actually playing melodies and ben played a lot of melodic stuff on super unknown his counterpoint for some of those songs is like fell on black days for example Mm -hmm. on that one on that chorus Mm -hmm. dude dude, the first chorus where he plays that moving like who would think of doing something like that Mm -hmm. it's so it's so completely out of you know out of character you know for anyone else that i could have thought of to come up with a line like that but it, it's fantastic. I don't know how he managed to come up with a bass line that's moving like that, is kind of dissonant, and is fighting harmonically with some of the instruments, but doesn't take your focus off the vocal. Mm-hmm. It's it's gorgeous. But if we tucked that bass, you would have never heard that. Yeah. You know? And it, pr- frankly, it would have made the song flatter. Mm-hmm. That's another reason why you don't want to tuck the bass. Yeah, I think in general, Ben's pretty underrated. I agree with you. He's really overlooked and he shouldn't be. He's one of the best bass players I've ever worked with. And his idea, his compositional stuff is just phenomenal. And what he brought to that band in terms of not only in terms of songs, but in terms of overall vibe was is inestimable. I mean, I think, you know, the band was always, you know, greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, as great as each of the individual people were. Mm-hmm. You know, and people look at it and think, you know, Soundgarden is Chris. And it's like, Chris had a solo career, you know, and the stuff that he did in the solo career was fine, sure. But personally, I wouldn't put it up against anything that he did with Soundgarden. You know, Mm -hmm. Soundgarden was very special, and it was because of the chemistry of those four guys together. That's my feeling anyway. Agreed. And when it comes to Ben, he even wrote two of the songs on the record, Head Down and Half. On songs like Half, it's not as if there's like a full band playing there either. 
mm-hmm. you know, the instrumentation is much different. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a song that I pushed for very hard uh, as well, because I felt that uh, Ben's contribution to the record was absolutely essential. Like it just, his work really adds something very unique to the whole thing and just augments it in this beautiful, beautiful way. Uh, and I, 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 I'm so happy that he was on that record and in that band, you know, and the same thing with, um, with head down, mm-hmm. yeah. but you know, with those two head down was more of a band song, but I think everyone also liked head down so much that no one had any problems adapting to it at all, you know? Uh, and the same with Matt songs. I mean, everyone just came in and played them and they, they got into the groove. I mean, you can feel that there's a different sensibility in each of those songs, but by and large, it all sounded, you know, it all sounds fluid. It all sounds like it fits together. Yeah, for sure. And I actually wanted to ask you about that. One of the things about Soundgarden that I'm impressed by is the fact that Ben, Matt, Kim, and Chris, they all play guitar. They can all write music. Not every band has that versatility. Were you aware that they had that versatility or was that like a pleasant surprise when you started working with them? Um, I found it out pretty quickly after I started working with them. I didn't know beforehand, but obviously when I knew that, I was I, I just thought, wow, this is great. And that on that basis, that's why I I I, I told the guys that I, I, I really encouraged them to contribute as much as they possibly could material wise. Mm-hmm, for sure. I felt that the rhythm section aspect of this record had to be very, very, had to stand away from the pack. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of that was because I, I felt that rock records had kind of deviated towards this, um, this really kind of thin sound where you got some attack out of the drums, but you didn't get a whole bunch of low end and depth and the same. And the bass was kind of thought of as a, kind of like an it was like an afterthought which yeah you know if you listen to records from like the 60s and 70s bass is out front because you know we're only a couple of years away from r&b records mm-hmm. you know which is where rock comes from and blues and things like that and bass is obviously a big deal you know you're driving the you're driving the rhythm section with the bass and the drums mm-hmm. and Especially like with bands like Metallica with their records, I mean, they just tried to bury bass guitar as much as possible. And I was like, why would you do that? Mm. You know, so my feel is like I I, I have to go the opposite direction. I, I, I came from more of an R&B background um, and I, I love dub music very much and things like mm. that where, where bass is very prevalent. So... When you look and when you listen to Led Zeppelin records, for example, yeah, you yeah. can hear every note the bass is playing, and that's re- it's really important because there's a lot of counterpoint in bass, you know. So to kind of eliminate it or to kind of stick it way in the background is to me it's kind of silly. I mean, you're missing all this beautiful like movement and you know, and again like counterpoint against vocal melody because if you're in a rock band, you can't really you, you don't have a lot of ex- there aren't a lot of opportunities to experiment with counterpoint without interfering with the guitar, with interfering with the vocal, because the only instrument you have apart from bass to do counterpoint would be a guitar, mm-hmm. you know, and you could be playing in the vocalist range. So to me, the rhythm section sound was going to be important on this record. Um, I found a rack of old Neve modules that no one had ever heard of before, these 1057s, which were Germanian, had Germanium transistors in them, hmm. as opposed to 1073s, which had silicon transistors. And they featured heavily in the drum sound on this record. Um, they just added this punch and this presence that I'd never really heard before. Basically, I did. We did a lot of stuff like that. You know, with the guitars, it was the same thing. Like trying to find the right coloration to sit with the bass. Because I didn't want to have a guitar sound that everyone else had. I wanted to get something else, something that was unique. Unfortunately, Chris is using very different guitars for rhythm, mm-hmm. so that helped. And we had a we had a great rig, and we wound up getting some really great guitar sounds. Did you do a lot you know, of layering so afterwards? It. Uh, a lot of layering on that one. On like on guitars and vocals, like was there a lot of layering for that record, or how did you approach that part of it? Not much. I mean, for the guitars, 
for for the for the main rhythm stuff, it was usually just a pair, mm-hmm. one pair. That was it. Earlier, you mentioned that you don't really consider Soundgarden just a grunge band, which I agree with you. They're certainly more versatile than that, but they are part of the the grunge lexicon, so to speak. And for a lot of people, they consider you know Kurt's death in April '94 kind of the end of grunge. But Super Unknown was released less than a month earlier, and it really took off afterwards. Do you feel in any way that Kurt's death kind of overshadowed the importance of Super Unknown to the story of grunge in any way? I don't really think that's anything I can speak to because I never felt particularly attached to that scene. Mm -hmm. Like, it never really mattered that much to me. I just, I, I'm not really fond of labels for music. Mm -hmm. Uh, because as I said before, I feel that it limits the artists who are involved. And I think grunge became sort of a convenient kind of super cut, you know, or moniker that people would kind of like imprint on every bit of music that came out of the greater SeaTac area. Yeah. And I just, you know, it's like, all right, grunge, whatever, you know, I mean, because you basically had all these bands that were starting to sound like each other at that point. Mm -hmm because they're all grunge like does that to me it didn't do any justice to the to the artists themselves i mean obviously they made the choice to go along with that but after a while it became sort of a marketing ploy Mm -hmm. you know it became something that record companies used to kind of typify or you know define define categorize who their artists were instead of like this these are rock bands you know one thing that i always go back to is this idea in the 70s that you know, if you're into rock music, there were lots of different bands. You know, if you liked rock music, there were bands like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple. But you could get into a straight up fist fight over those bands. Mm-hmm. Like someone could, you know, you could get one of these in the face. Like seriously, like people were would get riled up about this stuff. And they were they didn't have subgenres. It was basically just rock music, you know, but within this, but within Underneath the umbrella of rock, you could find artists that were div- that diverse that people would get like people would get really like excited or defensive about what they did, you know, and they were free to do their they had their own style. They were free to do their own thing. And with the advent of subgenres, I think that we lost some of that. Hmm. Yeah, no, I actually agree with you. I think that makes sense. You know, in addition to your producing, which was very different from what they did before, the songs themselves that Soundgarden recorded for that record were in some ways a departure from their previous sound. Did they ever discuss with you why they went in a more melodic direction, so to speak? Um, well, <laughs> I I mean, I, I'm going to take as much credit for that as I think they should, okay. you know, especially when it came to Chris. I mean, from the outset of the recording, I felt it was very important that not only was the music that they co- composed for this record the very best that they could come up with, I, I really encouraged the rest of the guys in the band to come with their as many of their own compositions as possible. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that there was like a, a very broad contribution from the band to this record, which, you know, I, I think to, to a great extent there was. But with Chris, since he was the primary songwriter, I really felt that it was essential that, that his songs were, were the absolute cream of the crop for him. And I noticed that he was starting to kind of fall into this um, headspace where a lot of the music that he was that he was coming up with, the songs he was coming up with, were kind of, it was sort of so-so. Like they weren't that exciting. And I, I started to get really worried about that, you know, so I had a conversation with him about it. And, you know, I, I really tried to reorient his thinking in terms of what kinds of songs that he wrote, not specifically melodic, but I just asked him, what do you like? Because from his perspective, I think he felt that he had to write songs that were going to please his audience. But my attitude was, you, you can't possibly know who these people are, what they really want. You know, all you can do is approach them from the perspective of being a performer who they love, which means that they're going to like what you do if you've put your heart and your soul into it. 
So let's proceed from that perspective instead of trying to please them. You know, mm-hmm. and when it came back to it, what he really liked was melodic songs, you know, and from that conversation actually came a couple of songs that went up on the record, Fell on Black Days and, of course, Black Hole Sun. That is really interesting. We did everything in a pretty rote fashion, mm-hmm. you know, in, in terms of the hierarchy of what instrument went first and what instrument went next and, you know, what, what we what we ended with. You know, on all the songs, it was pretty much the same thing. We started with drums. We added, we did, went to bass, added guitars, went to vocals. On some of the songs, we might add some percussion here and there, maybe a couple of other instruments. But it was pretty much all done the same way. The same with Fell on Black Days. It wasn't really... There wasn't anything about it that was out of character from the way we were recording anything else. But that was another one where where, uh, Chris played rhythm guitar, too. So, you know, I read an interesting quote from Chris where he said one of the, not conflicts, but one of the things that the band had to overcome with this record in particular is that all four people in the band had their own sense of rhythm, had their own sense of feel. And so there was kind of a clashing of ideas, so to speak. Was it difficult in any way to get all the guys on the same page or were they able to more or less mesh easily in what sense well he was saying for example if kim wrote a song his sense of timing like chris's sense of timing and his feel is different than kim so he'd have a hard time sometimes adapting to what kim wrote and vice versa or if ben wrote something then the guys would kind of have to adapt to ben's style i didn't really see anything like that when we when we made the record i didn't see any kind of, you know, moving in and out of like a certain person's style, you know, I mean, Kim tried to play the beginning. Chris actually wanted Kim to play the guitars on Black Hole Sun Hmm. because I think Chris was very concerned about, I guess, usurping Kim's role and being seen as someone who had Mm -hmm. taken over on the project and just sort of did all the, you know, rhythm guitar work. And, Kim came in and, you know, he tried to play the part, but he didn't have the same feel as Chris. In the end, Chris, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd hoped that Chris was going to do it sooner, but Chris was right to let Kim go through the whole process of at least trying it. So one song in particular I wanted to ask you about is She Likes Surprises. That song appears as the bonus track on the international release of Super Unknown, but not on the American version of the CD. Do you know why the American release didn't include that song? These are business decisions that don't involve me at all. Uh, In addition to that, I think that they did another version of that song. Oh, wait, no. I think that may have been the one that I did with them. Hmm. It may have been. They did a different version of No Attention, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, which was the other song that we recorded when we did those initial two uh, songs uh, before we went into track the, the full record. Uh, as far as she likes surprises being on anything, that's something that I, I was never privy to. So going back to Frank Sinatra for a moment, what else was it about Frank Sinatra as a singer that made you feel he'd be a good influence for Chris Cornell? He was an amazing stylist, but also he could really emotionally, pro- he could project emotionally and communicate really clearly everything that he was trying to get across. And obviously he sang a lot of upbeat, happy songs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this comes across, especially on three records in particular, um, the um, in the wee small hours of the morning, um, only the lonely, and the record he did with Antonio Carlos Jobim, mm-hmm. um, which is all Brazilian music, and those records have more of like a wistful kind of melancholy. So I mean, some of them are downright depressing, <laughs> and. You know, his ability to be able to kind of put you into his frame of reference as a listener and really kind of commune with you on that level, I think is really a a paramount example for any vocalist. Not to follow what what he's doing and try and emulate his style, but just to see how he's kind of getting all this across, like his phrasing, how he would... He, he got, actually got a lot of his ideas for phrasing from being in a band with Tommy Dorsey, who was a trombonist. Hmm. So you can hear that uh, type stuff that sounds like a trombone move. Hey guys, the following is how Black Hole Sun was made. <laughs> <laughs> 
Black Hole Sun is Soundgarden's biggest song, and Chris Cornell wasn't particularly thrilled about that. Black Hole Sun was released as the third single from the band's fourth studio record, Super Unknown, on May 13, 1994, eventually reaching the number one spot on the U.S. mainstream rock charts. Though the success of that song opened up many new doors for Soundgarden, Chris Cornell wasn't elated about the fact Black Hole Sun became the biggest song from Super Unknown. The following is a quote from Chris himself. Probably what bummed me out about Super Unknown, as far as questions go, was that the song that was most focused on was Black Hole Sun. That was probably the song with the most ambiguous and the least focused lyrics. No one seems to get this, but Black Hole Sun is sad. But because the melody is really pretty, everyone thinks it's almost chipper, which is ridiculous. It's funny because hits are usually sort of congruent, sort of an identifiable lyric idea, and that song pretty much had none. The chorus lyric is kind of beautiful and easy to remember. Other than that, I sure didn't have an understanding of it after I wrote it. I was just sucked in by the music and I was painting a picture with the lyrics. There was no real idea to get across. Lyrically, it's probably the closest to me just playing with words for words sake of anything I've written. I guess it worked for a lot of people who heard it, but I have no idea how you'd begin to take that one literally. Michael Beinhorn produced Black Hole Sun. He recalled the following about recording the vocals of the song with Chris Cornell. After the first time Chris sang it, he turned to me after a full day's worth of work, after listening to it, and went, it's not good enough. I mean, it's tough to say that to an artist, but when an artist says that to you about his own work, you're like, I love this guy. This is fantastic. I was like, okay, man, I'm with you 100%. Do what you've got to do. So he came back one week later, went back in, and we did the vocal that you hear. In terms of the vocals on Black Hole Sun, Chris Cornell recalls the following. When I sing it, there are elements of the Beatles in it and Led Zeppelin that I get from it, and also a little bit of the Sid Barrett era of Pink Floyd. I think the Beatles is one band that, if I'm working on a song arrangement or if I have some idea for a song and there's a little bit of a Beatles quality to it, I never avoid that. I always will steer into it. Considering how often the lyrics to major hit songs are analyzed, I think it's really interesting to hear directly from Chris Cornell that there was no real idea to get across with Black Hole Sun. With that said, however, there is one specific line in the song that does seem to suggest there is a message here. That line comes from the second verse of the song when Chris Cornell sings, Times Are Gone for Honest Men. In an interview with Rolling Stone from 1995, Chris Cornell spoke about this line. It's really difficult for a person to create their own life and their own freedom. It's going to become more and more difficult and it's going to create more and more disillusioned people who become dishonest and angry. There's so much stepping on the backs of other people in our profession. We've been so lucky that we've never had to do that. Part of it was because of our own tenacity and part of it was because we were lucky. So how exactly did the song come together? I'm going to be discussing that and more in this video. Hey, my name's Daniel. If you're new to my channel and you like rock music, make sure to subscribe. Everything I do here is 100% DIY and your subscription does go a long way to help support this channel. Soundgarden was formed as a band in 1984 and although they had success over the course of their first 10 years, it really wasn't until 1994 and Super Unknown, specifically with Black Hole Sun, that the band really took off commercially. 10 years in the life of a band is a long time, and over the course of those 10 years, Soundgarden went through a lot of ups and downs, yet they kept their integrity and were able to succeed. Now, when it comes to Black Hole Sun specifically, not only is it Soundgarden's biggest song, it's also their most recognizable music video. I'll be expanding on that a little later. As to how Chris Cornell came up with the song, the idea came to him during a drive home from a recording studio. I wrote it in my head driving home from Bear Creek Studio in Woodenville, a 35-40 minute drive from Seattle. It sparked from something a news anchor said on TV and I heard wrong. I heard blah blah blah, black hole sun, blah blah blah. I thought that would make an amazing song title. But what would it sound like? It all came together, pretty much the whole arrangement, including the guitar solo, as played beneath the riff. I spent a lot of time spinning those melodies in my head so I wouldn't forget them. I got home and whistled it into a dictaphone. The next day, I brought it into the real world, assigning a couple of key changes in the verse to make the melodies more interesting. Then I wrote the lyrics and that was similar, a stream of consciousness based on the feeling I got from the chorus and the title. By late 1992, Soundgarden began writing material for their upcoming record, though a lot of this material wasn't created together as a band. What generally happened during this period is that the individual band members wrote material on their own and then showcased that material to the rest of the band, after which they would polish up the songs together as a group. Chris Cornell is the one who came up with Black Hole Sun. He said the following in 1997. Generally, the songs I've been most proud of have been the least likely ones. It's weird. I wrote Black Hole Sun in about 15 minutes and it was a big hit, but I spent weeks and weeks on other songs that weren't. 
As mentioned, the song was produced by Michael Beinhorn, who in fact was the lead producer on the entire Super Unknown record. Interestingly, Soundgarden itself was also involved in producing the record to a certain extent. As a matter of fact, the band was involved in the production side of things for all six of their records. Nevertheless, when it comes to Super Unknown and Black Hole Sun in particular, Michael Beinhorn was the lead producer. Soundgarden's two previous records, Bad Motor Finger and Louder Than Love, were both produced by Terry Date. And although both records, particularly Bad Motor Finger, were successful, the band wanted to try something different. On why Soundgarden chose to work with Michael Beinhorn, Chris Cornell once stated the following, He definitely was involved in a lot of records that I thought were great, which is why I thought he'd be the perfect choice. And clearly, Super Unknown turned out great. One of the unique things Michael Beinhorn did during the recording process of Super Unknown is that he would have Chris Cornell listen to Frank Sinatra before recording vocals. In terms of the lyrics for the song, Chris Cornell once said the following, Lyrically, it didn't seem to be something that would be that easily relatable. It was very stream of consciousness to me. I didn't go over it and edit it. It is as it came out, and that's it. It felt right, and I let go. But it's very esoteric, and the only thing about it, I think, that makes sense in terms of how it could have been an international hit is singing the lines of the chorus. But when you don't overthink it or even think of it in any way, just let it be what it is creatively, maybe that strikes a chord in people because there's no analytical mind polluting it. As discussed, the studio where Black Hole Sun was recorded was Bad Animal Studio. The resident engineer at the studio at the time was Adam Casper. Adam Casper worked as an engineer on Super Unknown and would go on to produce Soundgarden's next two records, Down on the Upside and King Animal. Adam Casper once recalled the following about recording the vocals for Black Hole Sun. Doing the vocals was challenging in a lot of ways. Chris sings full voice on some of these songs, and one of the problems was being able to get the headphone mix up above his internal volume. So when you're singing and you're screaming, you can hear yourself, but you have to hear the music up above, and it's just so loud and feeding back. Now, interestingly, according to Chris Cornell, the band almost got Adam Casper fired from the studio during the recording process for Super Unknown. We almost got Adam Casper fired. He was the sole employee of the studio that was around us, the guy that we allowed to be around us. At some point, I think we just got really destructive and he didn't stop us, pretty much destroying the control room, and he almost got fired. The one thing that stopped us and got us to put our behavior in check was the fact that we didn't want poor Adam to lose his job. Thankfully, Adam Casper didn't get fired, and he and Soundgarden developed a long relationship with each other. Now, in terms of the sound of Black Hole Sun, it has a very prominent experimental quality. Same with the Super Unknown album as a whole. The following is from Adam Casper. It doesn't sound like a stale 90s record. The sounds, the approach were all very analog and organic, but also kind of pushing a lot of boundaries. So I think that's why it still sounds good today. There is something I think is really interesting. Beinhorn told me that he always had this electronic music agenda when he was making that record because he was from New York and he had worked with experimental musician Bill Laswell and they were into a pretty electronic kind of approach to music back in the 90s. I think he wanted to incorporate some of that into a rock record. I think he kind of did with some of the way the snares and things are overly compressed. I listened to that today and I was like, oh yeah, it kind of does do that. It's cool. The album has gone on to be Soundgarden's most commercially successful. Reflecting on this, Michael Beinhorn once said the following, To know that it's influenced so many people musically, that it's actually touched people and helped them go further in their own lives, to me, is the single most proud thing. Knowing that I played a role in that, it means so much. I am forever grateful to have been part of it in some small way. The music video for Black Hole Sun was directed by English filmmaker Howard Greenhall and was released in June of 1994. The following is from Chris Cornell as to how the music video came to be. We just read treatments for it, and Howard Greenhall's treatment just read weird as the video turned out. I suggested we pick one that we want, try to find a great one, and let the guy do whatever he wants. We should just be there and not emote, not pretend to be excited to play the song, deadpan, stand there, and do absolutely nothing. We chose his treatment because it seemed interesting. I told him on the phone, we're not going to do anything. You're not going to get anything out of us. We're just going to stand there because we don't want to do this anymore. Somehow, for whatever reason, he loved that. I loved the video because it worked. It just happened to be a guy with a great idea who happened to believe in our notion that we're reluctant video stars who are going to give you nothing. The contrast of us giving you nothing and your vision is actually going to be better than if we're jumping around acting like crazy rock people and you're doing these flash jump cut edits and crazy lighting. We're weird enough as it is, and we're tired of trying to not be. It worked. It was a big lesson. If you get out of somebody's way, or collaborate in the right way, a good thing can come out of it. Ultimately, the song ended up becoming a major success globally. 
In the U.S. specifically, Black Hole Sun reached number 9 on the top 40 charts, number 2 on the alternative airplay charts, and number 1 on the mainstream rock charts. To this day, the song remains the band's biggest hit. For instance, as of the time of this recording, the YouTube video for Black Hole Sun has around 182 million views. Soundgarden's second biggest video is Fell on Black Days with around 47 million views. Both Fell on Black Days and Black Hole Sun were released as singles from the Super Unknown record.